to this lecture, Demystifying the Chinese Economy, which will be delivered by Dr. Justin Yifu Lin, who is the chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank. And I think uh, his distinction is clear by the size of the audience. So welcome, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Lin, for coming. I just want to say a word or two about the event. It's being co-sponsored by the following campus department. So first of all, I'm director of the Institute of Governmental Studies, Jack Citrin, and Institute of Governmental Studies, together with the Institute of East Asian Studies, the Center for Chinese Studies, and the Department of Agricultural Resources and Economics are sponsoring this event. Uh, the event is being video recorded, and it'll be available on the campus webcasting service within the next week. If you want to view this, you should visit ieas.berkeley.edu. That's the Institute of East Asian Studies website. Uh, Dr. Lin will speak, and then there'll be a period of questions and answers. I just want to mention in the hallway, there's a desk which has flyers and an example of his two most recent publications on China. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Gordon Rouser, who will introduce Dr. Lin and who will moderate the event. A word or two about Dr. Rouser. He's currently the Robert Gordon Sproul Distinguished Professor here at Berkeley. He has served as the Dean of the College of Natural Resources and twice served as Chair of the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at Berkeley and also as Chair of the Giannini Foundation. He has won too many awards for me to mention. He served as the chief economist, at, uh, senior economist at the President's Council of Economic Advisors and subsequently the chief economist at the Agency for International Development in Washington, D.C., among many other important positions. But his most important role today is that he was actually responsible, I think, for bringing Dr. Lin to campus. So, Gordon. Who is Justin Lin? He's currently the chief economist and senior vice president at the World Bank. He is the founder and the first director of the China Center for Economic Research and a former professor of economics at Peking University. He obtained his PhD in economics from, of all places, the University of Chicago in 1986 and returned to China in 1987. And he was the first PhD in social sciences to return from abroad following the start of China's economic reform program in 1979. He obtained his MBA degree from a Taiwanese university in 1978 and a master's degree in Marxian political economy from Peking University in 1982. Now you ask yourself, does that tell you who Justin Lin is? No, it doesn't. Because if you stop and look at those markers with regard to his academic degrees, you naturally ask yourself, how is it that he got a master's degree in Taiwan in 1978 and subsequently got a degree in Marxian political economy in mainland China in 1982 and then found him his way to the economics department of U University of Chicago to get his PhD uh, in 1986? Well, there is further revelation about who Justin Lin is. He left Taiwan swimming from Taiwan to mainland China. Uh, and that explains in part why he got degrees from those two uh, resp respective universities in two different countries. Now, there's a lot of information on the internet with regard to this event. And I'm going to quote Justin Lin in his own words uh, after he explained from his new location in the People's Republic of China to his family why he defected from Taiwan. And I quote, based on my cultural, historical, political, economic, and military understanding, it is my belief that returning to the motherland is a historical inevitability. 
It is also an optimal choice, which reflects his focus on economics at that point. Now the question is, how did he get from Marxian political economy to the economics department at the University of Chicago? That was a real mystery for me until I asked him directly some years ago. It turns out that Theodore Schultz, who was and who did set the standard for the agricultural economics profession of his generation, had just won a Nobel Prize and he was giving uh, seminars throughout China and who was his interpreter? It turned out to be Justin Lin. I spent some time at University of Chicago and if there was a student applying for the economics program uh, at the University of Chicago and they had on their CV the fact that they'd gotten a master's degree in Marxian political economy, you might advise them not to apply. However, in this particular instance, Justin didn't have to apply. Theodore Schultz was so impressed with Justin Lin, he said, please, please come and do your PhD degree in economics. You don't have to apply. I will make sure that you are an active participant in our PhD program. Now, Theodore Schultz set the standard for agricultural economics, as I indicated, and what's happened subsequently over the last 25 years since Justin has completed his PhD, he has set the professional standard for economic development and in particular governmental intervention in orchestrating transition economies. Uh, and he's going to be talking about one of his books today, but he has many books. The one that I'm particularly impressed with is his book uh, based on his Marshall Lectures entitled Economic Development in Transition. Uh, he has another book that's forthcoming uh, from the World Bank on structural, new structural economics. Uh, he's a very prolific writer uh, and a very persuasive and articulate presenter of effective public policies to assist in economic growth. And nowhere is this currently more important than, and I don't want to over-exaggerate, anywhere in the world than in China. As we came out of the Great Recession, which was the first country that was able to put in place a stimulus package that, in, in effect, did exactly what you would expect, support economic growth and invite inflation. In the Western democracies, they put in place stimulus package and we have been fighting with potential probabilities of deflation again and again. When the current European debt, sovereign debt crisis has emerged over the last six months, whenever they talk about a third party stepping up to help finance and or facilitate the purchase of euro bonds from the European Central Bank, if in fact they ever become the land lender of last resort, people talk about China after they mention IMF and realize IMF is only sitting on $400 billion and thus it's impossible for them to solve the problem. Uh, moreover, whenever there's a report about economic conditions in China, more, most recently this last week when their PMI, PMI numbers came out and they were below the magic criteria of 50, the markets throughout the world declined dramatically in part because they were deathly afraid that China with their tight monetary policy was not going to be able to achieve or orchestrate a soft landing, but may be faced with a hard landing. And if that were to happen, how does it affect the global economy? As a result, if Justin can demystify the Chinese economy for us, we're all gonna be better off. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for such a nice introduction. The best I ever had. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in effect, it's quite an honor and a pleasure for me to come to give this occasion. Because as Gordon just mentioned, I was the professor at the Peking University for 15 years before I took my job at the World Bank. Certainly, it's a challenging time at the World Bank, and it's also an honor for an economist to serve at the World Bank during this challenging time. I was delighted, but there's one thing I missed. 
That was to talk to my colleagues, to talk to the students. And my tenure at the World Bank will end very soon, June next year. And I make the public. I will return to Peking University to be a professor. So today is a good warm up <laughs> for me. And I'd like to talk about the Chinese economy. In the past 32 years, since the reform started in 1979. And uh, if I need to use only one word to describe the achievement of Chinese economy. I think the only suitable word would be miracle. Because in 1979, when the reform started, the per capita income in China was only a third of the per capita income in sub-Saharan African countries, only one third. But the growth rate in China for the past 32 years, on the average, was 9.9% continuously for 32 years. As a result, the per capita income in China, the economic size increased 20.5 times. And uh, by the time of 2010, last year, the per capita income in China reached 4,376 US dollars. The per capita income now is almost four times as high as the per capita income in sub-Saharan African countries. And in the past 32 years, China not only maintained a high growth rate, it is also a process of opening up of the Chinese economy. Because in 79, China, like other, you know, plant economy and so on, was very inward looking. Because export and import as a percentage of Chinese economy at that time was only 9.5%. And in the past 32 years, the annual growth rate of Chinese trade was 16.3% per year. And the trade volume in China increased 144 times. And now, the export plus import is a percentage of Chinese GDP, increased from 9.5% up to 65%. And I'd like to say, among the large economy, among the large economies in the world, and what I mean large economy is a country with a population more than 100 million. The Chinese economy is the most open, in a sense. Take the US as example. Its export plus import in the US is only between 20% to 25% of GDP. In China, it's 65%. And during these 32 years, China transformed from an agrarian economy. Because in 79, more than 80% of the population live in rural areas. More than 75% of the labor force were in agriculture. But now China turned into the workshop of the whole world. The largest producer of the manufacturing product in the whole world. And China also became the largest exporters, the largest producer of car. And in this process, more than 600 million people get out of poverty. We know that the United Nations has one goal called the Millennium Development Goal. And the number one item is to reduce the poverty, people in the poverty by half from 1990 to 2015. And China alone 
made that goal achieved already. And uh, not only the Chinese growth contribute to the improvement of income different standard in China. China also made a contribution to the global economy and uh, one example was during the East Asian financial crisis. China did not devalue its currency and avoid the competitive devaluation in East Asian and help the East Asian economy to have a recovery very soon. And the other example is since 2008, when the global crisis hit, China quickly had a counter-cyclical fiscal you know, stimulus. And I started in 2009, China started to have a recovery and maintain on the average more than 9% growth rate in the past three years and help the global economy to have a recovery. And I'd like to say, such a remarkable performance was not expected by anyone. Because in the 1980s, 1990s, even up to 2000, 2003, 2004, one of the most popular hypotheses we talk in the world was when China is going to collapse. But China did not collapse. China continued to grow so dynamically. And this was even not anticipated by the architect of China's reform, Deng Xiaoping himself. Because the target set by Deng Xiaoping in 1979, 1980s, was to quadruple the Chinese economy in 20 years. Quadruple increased four times. And as Gordon mentioned, I was a graduate student at the Peking University at that time. And so I wanted to understand if China wanted to quadruple the economies in 20 years, what should be the growth rate per year? At that time, certainly, we did not have the calculators. So I used you know, calculation by approximation to find out what should be the growth rate. And I spent the whole afternoon started with, if China grow at 5% per year, can China quadruple the economy? So 1.05 multiplied by 20 times, it was too low. Then if China grow at 10% per year, so 1.120 times, it was too high. So the whole afternoon, eventually, I found out it should be 7.2% per year. But actually, at that time, I could not believe China could grow at 7.2% per year continuously for 20 years. Because in our economic profession, we know there was a theory called the natural rate of growth. And it said, for any country, except for the recovery from the war destruction or calamities, it was impossible for any country to grow at 7% for several years. And uh, as a student, certainly, I accept those kind of hypotheses. And at that time, Peking University you know, had some professors visiting Peking University and taught in the classes. And so I asked one of the professors from New York, and I asked him whether it was possible for China to continue the growth of 7.2% for 20 years. And he told me, according to his experiences, it was impossible. But now we find, in effect, Deng Xiaoping was too conservative. As I mentioned, the growth rate in China was 9.9%, not 7.2%. Not for 20 years, it was for 20, 32 years. And those 2.7% difference, actually, it's a big difference because if China grow at 7.2% continuously for 32 years, the economic size in China will only increase. 9.2 times 
but as I mentioned now, is 20.5 times of the Chinese economic size in 1979. But today, what I'd like to discuss with you is that how could it be possible for China to grow at such a high rate for such a long time after the reform started in 1979? How come it was possible? Well, then the question is that, how come it was impossible for China to have a similar growth rate before 1979? And the other question related, is the main reason was the reform for China to have such an outstanding growth rate we know that in the 1980s, 1990s, many socialist countries and other developing countries in the world all engaged in reform. How come they could not have a similar growth rate? And then my other question is that, well, what are the costs for China paid to have such an outstanding growth rate? I'm sure everything in the world has two sides. And what are the negative side? And the other question is that, as Gordon mentioned, now in, uh, in uh, this great de recession, and uh, we are in uh, some situation, some economists call new normals, you know, low growth rate, low return to investment, and high risk. And we all know that the only way out for this new normal is growth. Right, and that's, that's the reason why people pay so much attention to any sign of the growth in China. And my question is that, can China maintain similar growth rate for another 10 or 20 years? If China can do that, certainly it will be a very good news for all of us here but whether it's possible or not. And the last question is that, now I'm the chief economist of the World Bank. Certainly, I'm concerned about other developing countries. So my, question, my last question is that, can other developing countries have a similar growth rate as China had in the past 32 years? So those are the six questions I'd like to share with you this afternoon. Regarding the first question, the high growth rate in China, I'd like to mention high growth rate continuously for an extended period of time is a modern phenomenon. Because we know, according to some historian, like you know, Angus, uh, uh, Angus uh, uh, Madison, he just passed away, and others. Before 18th century, for countries in Eastern Europe, uh, in Western Europe, those high income countries today, their average annual growth rate of per capita income was 0.05%. What does that imply? It implied that for country now we consider as the highest income country in the world, before 18th century, it took 1,400 years to double their per capita income. So actually, within everyone's lifetime, they could not you know, feel, they could not sense any kind of growth at all. 1,400 years. Then entering into the 18th century, 19th century, the rate of growth in those higher income part of the world jumped 20 times from 0.05% to only average about 1% per year. And for 1% per year, it means what? It means that it took about 70 years 
to double per capita income. That means that if you life is long enough, you can observe, you know, the material available to you will be doubled. Okay, then entering into the 20s, late 19th century, 20th century, the rate of per capita income in a high income part, Western European country, North America, double again from 1% per year to 2% per year. And 2% per year means what? It took about 35 years to double the per capita income. And this is a phenomenon only occurred after the 18th century. And how come that after the 18th century, there was such a dramatic regime shift in terms of growth rate? Well, the answer is simple, because the Industrial Revolution. And after the Industrial Revolution, the rate of technological changes accelerated. And with the acceleration of technological changes, there were productivity increase. And certainly, the income of the people can increase in an acceleration rate. But if the technological changes is the nature of modern economic growth, it's the foundation of modern economic growth. For the high-income country, we know, since the Industrial Revolution, they are all on the global technological frontiers, right? So they need to invent the technology to achieve technological innovation. But for developing countries, their technologies locate within a global technological frontier. And for economists, we know what important is not invention. What important is innovation? Innovation only means that in the next period of production, you can use some technologies which is better than the technology you are using now. And for the developing country, there's a possibility called latecomer advantages or advantage of backwardness. Because your technology locate within a global technology frontier. And so you have an opportunity to adopt some technology which is new to you but which has been invented, which has been used, which has been matured by the advanced country. And if a developing country knows how to tap into that potential, then their rate of technological changes can be much faster than the high-income country. And the cost for their technological innovation will also be much lower and a much less risk. And if a country know how to enter into that, in effect, since the Second World War, there were certain economies tap into the potential and achieve 7% and a more growth rate continuously, continuously for 25 years or more. And the possibility for that is tapping into this advantage of backwardness. And China became one of those 13 economies in the world after China started reform in 1979. And that was the reason that China could have such a remarkable growth rate continuously for so long. But it makes my answer to the second question become hard, right? If the advantage of backwardness is the reason for China to have such a remarkable growth rate after 79, but advantage of backwardness has been there for a century, how come China could not benefit from that advantage of backwardness to have similar growth rate? Or oh, that related to the development strategy, the development path. We know that. China, the socialist government, you know, took over in 1949, and after three years recovery from the war destruction, China started to have a nation building. And in the 1950s, the goal of China's economic development was to 
catching to overtake the United Kingdom in 10 years and to catch up the United States in 15 years in Chinese work called Sinan Chao Yin Su Nan Gan Mei. That means that China wanted to develop the most modern industries <coughs> immediately. And this kind of attempt to develop a most modern industry, use most modern technologies, made China you know, given up the opportunity to tap into the potential of advantage of backwardness. Because the most modern industry still with the protection of pattern. And uh, also for the national security reason, the high income country, including the US or Britain and so on, they would not give those kind of technology to China, right? And so if China wanted to develop those kind of industries, China needed to reinvent the wheel, pay the same cost as a high income country. And so China could not use those kind of advantage of backward to accelerate the growth in China. Not only so. Those kind of industries were very capital intensive. But in 1950s, China was an agrarian economy. China was abundant in labor force and a little bit resources. But China was skills in capitals. That means what? The capital intensive industry was not the competitive advantage of the Chinese economy. And if China wanted to develop those kind of industries, to go against the competitive advantage means what? Means firm in those kind of sectors were not viable in an open competitive market. Since they are not competitive, so they require the government protection, government subsidies, in order to make an investment and to continue to operate in the system. And this kind of protection and subsidy and so on always came as the distortion of all kinds of price signals. With those kind of distortion, yes, China was able to build up the heavy industries. And so China was able to test their nuclear weapon in 1960s. China was able to launch the satellite in the 1970s. However, the resource allocation was very poor. Efficiency was very low. And all those kind of distortions result in repression of the incentive, so people would not work hard. And with poor resources allocation and no incentive, certainly the performance of the growth will be very poor. And that was the reason why that China performed so poorly. And China started to tap into the potential of the advantage of backwardness only after the reform started in 1979. China started to develop the sectors which China had compared advantages. That is labor intensive sectors because China has such a large supply of labor force. And once China entered into the labor intensive sectors, China became very competitive because we know competitive advantages is the foundation for competitive advantages. And since it, once China entered into the labor intensive industry, China became so competitive domestic internationally. So China trade grows so fast, China take over so such a large domestic market and international market. And with that, certainly China, you know, industry became very profitable and China can accumulate a lot of surplus and they use those kind of surplus to make investment, turn into capitals. And the capital increasingly become more available, more abundant. And China gradually upgrade 
from labor intensive industry to more capital intensive industry step by step. And in this kind of upgrading process, China could rely on the advantage of backwardness. And that was the reason why that China you know, did not perform well, and China performed so well after the transition started in 1979. Then we come into another puzzle. We know that since the Second World War, almost all the socialist countries follow similar Stalinist model. The Stalinist model always advised the country to develop heavy industry, capital intensive industry, on the basis of agrarian economy. So they have a similar distortion, they have similar challenges. And I like to say, that kind of idea to develop capital intensive industries was a fashion in the 1950s, 1960s. Almost all the developing country, no matter it's capitalist or socialist, no matter it's in, it's a, in Asia, in Eastern Europe, or the capitalist economies in Latin America, in Africa, in South Asia, they all adopted so-called import substitution strategies. And they tried to develop the most modern industries at that time on their poor agrarian basis. So the distortion, no matter it's in socialist country or in a capitalist country, if you look into the natural distortion, in the 1950s, 1960s, in the effect, were all the same. And uh, also, when China started the transition in the 1980s, almost all the developing country and the socialist country also had this transition. And how come? For most developing country and a socialist country, after the transition, in effect, their economic performance were even worse than the economic performance in the 1960s and 1970s. And I have a colleague, former colleague at World Bank called Bill Easterly, and he compared the economic performance of developing country in the 1960s. 1970s, with the transition reform period of 1980s and 1990s. And I thought he found is that the average growth rate of these developing countries in the 1980s, 1990s, during their transition periods, were lower than the average growth rate in the 1960s and 1970s during the import substitution strategy periods. Not only the growth rate was lower, their economy was even more volatile, measured by the volatilities, the developing country during the transition periods. In the 1980s, 1990s, were even higher than in the 1960s and 1970s. So all these measures indicate other developing countries during their transition, no matter it's a socialist or non-socialist, their economic performance was even worse. However, the root of the problem was similar to the problem in China. How come their performance was even worse? Well, the main reason was that most other countries, during the transition period, they follow the Washington Consensus. And the Washington consensus, you know, observe all of the developing countries, no matter it's a socialist or non-socialist, they have too many government intervention. And so they advise the country to institute a set of ideal market institutions. And in their you know, perception about the issue is that market failures was the root of their problem. Uh, government failure was the root of the problem, so they need to improve their market institution by privatization, liberalization, and stabilization. And I think the goal of you know, introduce ideal market institution is fine, but there are two problems. The first problem, this approach neglected that a lot of distortion in the past, in effect, were endogenous. It's economic jargon 
That means they were designed for the purpose to protect the non-viable form in the government priority sectors. They are non-viable. They require government protection in order to survive. And if you try to remove all those distortions immediately, what will be the result? There are only two possibilities. One is that you are going to encounter a widespread collapse in your state-owned sectors. And you are going to have 30% or 40% of unemployment. As a result of those kind of high unemployment, you can imagine it was impossible to have social stability and a political stability. Without social stability and political stability, you could not have economic growth. That's one thing. Or for fear of those kind of disaster. After introduced the Washington consensus reform, the government introduced another set of even more disguised distortion. And it used economic jargon is that they change from second best to third best or even fourth best. And there's also a lot of empirical evidence to show that. For example, in Russia, all those big state-owned enterprises have been privatized. But careful analysis show the subsidies to those kind of state-owned enterprises today is even higher than the subsidies before the transition started. Well, it's not so hard to understand how come the subsidy would be higher. As I mentioned, they are not viable. They require on government protection to survive. And the government is not willing to allow them to go bankrupt, either for job protection issue or for national pride, because they are in the advanced sectors. So they require on subsidies. Then we can do a little bit experiment. Their survivor require government subsidies. And uh, if it's owned by state, the managers are bureaucrats, right? Certainly, they will use the viability as an excuse to argue for protection and subsidies. But after they get a subsidy, they cannot pocket that subsidy directly because if they try to you know, make the subsidies become their income, it become a corruption. But if it, after privatization, the private enterprises, entrepreneur will not you know, help the government to pay those kind of costs, right? Certainly, they will ask the government to give them subsidies and protection. And, but in a private ownership, that the more you ask, the government to give you subsidies, the more you can pocket that as your income. It's legal. And certainly, after the privatization, the subsidy to all those old state-owned enterprises actually increase. As a result, their performance become even less efficient. You know, before the reform, the Washington consensus you know, proposal say, prominent, say that you, know, you are going to have a transition you know, decline but within six months, at most one year, you're going to have a very dynamic rebound. And so they call that J curve. A small dip, and then very dynamic growth. But I jokingly say, actually, they don't have a J curve. They have an L curve. They have a big collapse, and then stagnate for a long time, you know, more than 10 years, and then a small recovery. But how come China could grow so fast? During the transition, it was because China adopted some kind of dual track approach. On the one hand, in recognition that the old sectors are not viable, they require some subsidies. So the government continued to give them subsidies. Certainly, introduced some kind of marginal reform to improve incentive, but subsidies protecting continue to be there. On the one hand, liberalize the entry to the sector which were replaced in the past. That was agricultural sectors. That was labor-intensive manufacturing sectors. 
and uh, the protection to the oil sectors retain the stability of Chinese economy. And the liberalizing of the entry to the sectors which are consistent with China's comparative advantages, it generate the dynamic economic growth. So China achieved stability and growth simultaneously. And the rapid growth in the new sectors create a condition to reform the old sectors for two reasons. The first one, with rapid growth in the labor intensive sectors, as I mentioned, capital has been accumulated quickly. So some of the oldest capital intensive sectors which were not viable in the past, which were not China's competitive advantage in the past, gradually become China's competitive advantage because capital endowment has been increased. And secondly, even you have some sectors which are still not China's competitive advantages. At that time, the government can allow them to go bankrupt because the job creation in the labor intensive sectors have been so large, can offer the job, and so even some of the older sector in a collapse, job is not an issue. So social stability can be maintained. So that's the reason why the performance of the transition has been so different, because China has been more pragmatic. Try to understand the issue but at the same time to understand the opportunities. Instead of, uh, in a real economy, instead of just try to you know, impose some kind of idea institution based on the textbook. Then what kind of cost China paid for its success of dynamic growth in the past 32 years? I think the cost that China paid was the imbalances in the economy. And these imbalances you know, appear in income. So at the beginning of the transition, China was quite an agrarian economy, uh, quite an egalitarian economy, measured by Gini coefficient at that time was only about 0.3. But in the past 32 years, yes, everyone's income level increased but income distribution become more polarized. And so now, major by Gini coefficient, China reached about 0.45 per six, approaching the situation in Latin America. And this kind of polarization of income certainly creates some kind of social tension in China. That is one thing. And the second thing is that the saving rate in China is extremely high. And the consumption as a percentage of GDP has been declining. In the 1990s, consumption contributed to about 60% of GDP. And now it dropped down to about 35%. And the saving rate has been exceeding 50% for decades. That's the second issue. And the third issue is that trade surplus trade imbalance, China accumulates such a large trade surplus and a foreign reserve. As you know now, the foreign reserve in China reach more than three trillion. Those are the three imbalances. And like to say, these three imbalances all related to the way China doing the transition. And uh, these three imbalances are all the legacies of the dual track reform, some kind of legacy of distortion still exists in China. As I mentioned, during this transition, the old sectors is still there. And for the old capital intensive sectors, they are not viable, they rely on the government subsidies and protection. Before 83, and you know, all their operational cost investment and so on came from the fiscal appropriation. But starting in 1983, the government introduced some kind of reform trying to improve the efficiency, so change it from the fiscal appropriation to bank loans. However, the bank loan 
were given mainly to the large state-owned enterprises. And the system in China to do that was to establish four large state-owned banks. And those state-owned banks are the core of China's financial system. In the 1990s, China introduced equity market, stock market. Again, stock market only serve large corporations, right? As a result, as I mentioned, the competitive advantage of Chinese economy was labor-intensive industries, or agricultural, labor-intensive agricultural households. But in general, they are small. They would not get any financial services. Only the large corporation, corporation owned by the state, or corporation owned by the rich people, have financial services. And this had implica two implications for income distribution. The first one was the capital cost, no matter its interest rate, or the cost to raise capital on equity market actually were lower than it should be for China at this stage of development. So it was a subsidies. It's a subsidies to those large corporations, to those large corporations owned by rich people or owned by the state. And uh, who subsidized them? Those people who put the money into the system. And those people, in general, are relatively poor compared to the rich people. And they would not get the financial services. So that means what? This financial system means that you ask the poorer people to subsidize the rich people and the large corporation. Certainly, as a result, you see income increasingly concentrated on the large corporation. So that's the reason why, in terms of high saving, half of the saving comes from the big corporation and rich people. In effect, the way to subsidize the corporation helps another channel. Because with this kind of financial system, it replaces the development of labor-intensive agricultural household or manufacturing sector or service sectors. And those kind of certainly compared to the past that they developed very much, but compared to the potential, they were replaced, right? Because they did not have any financial services. As a result, their growth rate was lower than it should be. And as a result, the job creation was lower than it should be. And so it reduced the job opportunity, it replaced the wage rate. We know that poor people, the main source of income is their wage income, right? It has been replaced. And uh, the law labor costs become a subsidy to the corporation. So that's the reason why the income become less and less equal and a concentrate on the big corporation. One thing. And the second thing, this kind of income distribution certainly will result in the declining in the consumption. We know that poor people have higher consumption propensity. Rich people have lower consumption propensity. And uh, you, you know, have this kind of polarization of income, and uh, increasing the income has been concentrated on the rich people, certainly their saving propensity is higher, their consumption propensity is lower, and uh, contribute to the high saving, low consumption. And especially if the income is constrained to only corporation, their consumption propensity is even lower. And that causing this kind of pattern. Consumption as a percentage of GDP from 60% now drop down to only 35%. The third thing, with this kind of saving and consumption, China invests a lot. The, product, the production capacity increased very quickly. But with this kind of smaller, lower, small proportion of consumption, that means domestic absorption has been replaced, right? So you increase the production a lot, but domestic absorption has been depressed. And so you are going to have a large gap. Who are going to consume those gap? International market, US. So that cause trade surplus in China has been so large and a trade deficit in the U.S. has been so large. Well, 
That is one chain of financial sectors. In addition to the financial sectors, there are other channels for distortion in the income. And the other one was natural resources. China is a resources poor country, and uh, all the resources, mining and so on, owned by the state. However, the state would not charge any loyalty levy for the mining companies. Before 79, it's fine because all the mining companies are owned by the state. At the same time, the prices for the resources were artificially suppressed as a subsidy to the state-owned sectors in the industries. But after 79, gradually, the prices of the resources has been liberalized, so close to international price. And the private sectors as well as the state sector can all enter into the mining sectors. As a result, whoever can get the, the license, the concession to do the mining, the person will immediately become billionaire. Because it is a transfer of national wealth to those people who can get access to the mining because they don't have to pay almost whatsoever loyalty. And that contributes to the income distribution you know, become less and less equal. And a third one, certainly, there are some remaining monopoly in the telecommunication, in the financial sectors, and you're going to have a monopoly rent. So all those are the legacies of the dual check of reform. And if China wanted to be a well-functioning market economy, China need to remove all those kind of distortions. And if China can remove those kind of distortions, certainly all those imbalances can be improved. And certainly, from what I see, the Chinese government understands that. And so if you look into the 12th five-year plan and so on, they do introduce a lot of those kind of reform element there. But Chinese government is always very cautious, gradual, so we can hope it will be improved continuously, but it's unlikely to remove all those distortions immediately. Okay. Then my next question, how long China can maintain this kind of eight or nine percent growth rate? I would be very optimistic. I think that China can maintain at least another 20 years. I think China at least can maintain another 20 years. It should be a very good news. How come I'm so confident to think that China can maintain this kind of growth rate for another 20 years? Because, again, the advantage of backwardness. In 2008, based on the purchasing power parity measurement, China's income was 21% of the U.S. per capita income. Per capita income is a very good measurement of the level of the development in a country, the level of technological advancement in a country. U.S. certainly represent the highest income country, represent the most technologically advanced country. And the newest data I have, according to Angus Madison, was 2008. In 2008, the per capita income in China was 21% of U.S. per capita income. And it was Japan in 1951. Japan in 1951, its per capita income was 21% of U.S. per capita income. It was Taiwan in 1971. Again, Taiwan in 1971, per capita income was 21% of U.S. per capita income. It was Korea in 1977. Okay, let's look. Japan from 1951 to 1971, for 20 years, the average annual growth rate was 9.2% per year. For Taiwan from 75 to 95, 20 years, the average annual growth rate was 8.3%. For Korea, from 1977 to 1997, for 20 years, the average annual growth rate was 7.6%. For Japan, from 1977 to 1997, 
We know that after the reform started in 1979, China followed a similar path of the development as other East Asian economies, including Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. With similar advantage of backwaters, Japan could grow 9.2%, Taiwan 8.3%, Korea 7.6% continuous for 20 years. There's no reason to doubt it is possible for China to have another 20 years of around 8% growth rate. The potential is there. And if China can grow at a rate, what will be the size of Chinese economy? Well, in 1971, after 20 years of 9.3%, 9.2% growth rate, Japan's per capita income increased from 21% to 65.6%, about two thirds of US per capita income. Taiwan, after 20 years of dynamic growth, it reached 54.2%. Korea, after 20 years of dynamic growth, it reached 50.2%. So I think if China can maintain 8% growth rate continuously for another 20 years, I think most likely China's per capita income measured by purchase power parity will be at least 50% of US per capita income. But we need to remember the population size in China is up more than four times our US population size. So that means that measured by purchasing power parity, in 2030, China's economic size could be about twice as large as the US economic size. Certainly, measured by market exchange rate, it can be lower. Depends on how much Chinese currency appreciate. But I think at least by the time of 2030, the economic size in China measured by market exchange rate will be as large as the US economy. And this dynamic economic growth, it maintained Certainly, it's good for China, but also I think it's also good for the world. Because on the one hand, the way to get out of the new normal is growth. And China represents the possibility of dynamic economic growth. And it will help the world, help the US, European country to get out of current mess. And if China can maintain this kind of growth, it's not only good for the high-income country, actually it's also good for the developing country. Because it will leave a huge space for other developing countries to enter into the manufacturing sectors. But are they have the potential to do that? From my analysis, yes. But there are two conditions. One condition is that all the developing countries, in the process of development, they need to follow their competitive advantages to make their industry, their economy competitive. And if they can be competitive, follow their competitive advantages, they can tap into the potential advantage of backwardness. Then they should be able to maintain 8% or 9% growth rate continuously for several decades. But certainly we also know a lot of developing countries today are troubled with all kinds of distortions due to the legacy of the wrong policy intervention in the past. And certainly they need to address those kind of distortions. But this challenge experiences also offer some kind of lesson. Those kind of distortion certainly you know, has some cost to the economies, 
and you need to remove them. But in the process of removing those kind of distortions, the dual track approach offers some kind of insight. You need to understand the nature, the reason, the root of those kind of distortions. If it was designed as a way to protect certain kind of sectors, you need to ask, can you afford to have the collapse in those kind of sectors? Either for the purpose of job or national pride. If you cannot afford them to go bankrupt immediately, it's better to adopt a certain kind of dual track approach. You liberalize the entry to the sector which you replaced in the past to generate dynamic economic growth. And with dynamic economic growth, you will create a condition to remove the distortion in all sectors. And this kind of pragmatic approach work in China, but I like to say, not only in China. If you look into the good performers in the world, after the Second World War, except for the East Asian country without much distortion to begin with. Other country with distortion who started, like Mauritius, adopt the old institution strategy with a lot of distortion. After the 70s, they started to perform very well. They also adopt this kind of dual track. Allow entry to the new sectors, continue to pro protect all sectors. And uh, Vietnam, Laos, certainly, they follow China. In Eastern European country, the best performer, like Slovenia, also adopt your track. So this is some lesson may be useful for the other developing country. And I'd like to say, if they can follow these two principles, I'm confident all the country, all the developing country in the world will have the possibility to grow at 8% or more continuously for 20, 30, 40 years, and they can turn from a low-income country to middle-income country or even high-income country within one generation or two generations. And at the World Bank, we have a dream called a world free of poverty. Maybe that will realized if all the countries know how to follow this approach. Thank you very much. Any questions, observations? Yes, here. Uh, there, uh, a mic. We're covering with the mic. mic. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Alex Lopez. I'm a uh, student here at Cal, uh, majoring in development studies. My question is, uh, you know, when the World Bank gives out these loans to developing nations, you know, yeah. you impose a structural adjustment policies yeah. that uh, favor the corporations and the elite. You know, money trickles up; it does not trickle down. So as chief economist of the World Bank, what are you going to do to change these policies, or are you going to continue the same destructive policies that displace millions and millions of small farmers and peasants from rural areas all over the world? That's a good question. And I'd like to say World Bank is a knowledge bank, and certainly World Bank continues to learn from its own practice. Certainly the policy in the World Bank reflect the development thinking at the time. For example, before the 70s, the World Bank focused on infrastructure industrial development, followed the old infrastructure strategies. It did not perform well. After the 80s, the development thinking changed to the Washington Consensus, so you have those kind of structural adjustments long. But uh, because World Bank need to you know, have the practice, need to observe what's happening on the ground. So I'd like to say, World Bank started to have a rethinking in the 1990s. For example, in 1994, the World Bank published the book called the East Asia Miracles. And the East Asia Miracle you know, was a study trying to understand the reason why East Asian economy could perform so well. And their conclusion was market-based, market-friendly government, and also export promotion. So that's one lesson. And secondly, in 2004, after 10 years of the transition in Eastern European country, 
the World Bank published a study called the first 10 years. Try to understand the lessons. And the lesson was there was no one size fit all policy. So it's a reflection of those kind of one size fit all policy in the Washington consensus. The third one in 2008, the World Bank published the Gross Commission Report. And the Gross Commission Report was headed by Michael Spence, a Nobel laureate. Try to understand the reason for the success of those 13 economies I mentioned. And their finding was five status effects. The first one, open economy. The second one, high saving rate. The third one, macro stability. The first one, market mechanism. The fifth one, proactive government. So you can see World Bank is changing. And also, myself is a good example, right? I'm the first one to be the chief economist of the World Bank coming from the developing country. So I would say certainly everyone you know, follow what we understand. But unfortunately, sometimes what we understand may not be right. And so we need to continue to improve our knowledge. And I'd like to say, so far in economic profession, not only in economic profession, let me be a little bit more provocative. In all the social sciences, the theory basically based on the experiences in the advanced country since the Industrial Revolution, not only in economics, but also in politics, in other social sciences. Certainly, those kind of understanding provide some insight. But the opportunity and the challenge in a developing country are different. As I mentioned in my analysis, certainly technological innovation, industrial upgrading, industrial diversification are the mechanism for the growth. It's a modern growth. But the nature of innovation will be different. For the high-income country, the nature of innovation is invention. But for the developing country, the nature of innovation can be imitation, licensing. OK. And, and, but if you look into the growth theory, they only describe how the high-income country continue to have the innovation. And otherwise, what kind of element that you require for that continuous invention. Very often, we come to study at Berkeley, we come to study at Chicago. And we were taught by that theory, and we go back to home and to try to apply that theory to your country. Right? So I think it's an obligation for us to really try to understand what are the mechanisms for the catching up in the developing country. And if we can have a better understanding of this process, I think we can make a better contribution to the development to the catching up in the developing country. I would not, you know, I, and, and so now the World Bank has started to promote so-called open knowledge, open data system, try to encourage the researchers in the developing country to have access to the data so they can do the research and understand their own challenges and opportunity come up their own solutions. Hi, my name is Jesse. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, you mentioned the accumulated savings rate within China. Yeah. I was wondering if you see a difference in how they play into growth between the national accumulated savings, perhaps from a trade surplus, and household savings rate yeah. on the individual level, and how those two can play into uh, transitioning towards more consumption domestically within China. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, the national saving, supposedly that you introduce the reform I recommend, for example, financial sectors. Instead of it was dominated by four state banks. And actually, I do have a theory called the optimal financial structure to say country in different stages of development, their financial structure should be different because for the developing country, you know, the majority of their production activities are in the traditional labor-intensive sectors. 
either in agriculture and service is a manufacturing sectors. In general, the technology use are mature, and their size of operation is small, and, and the capital requirement is also small. And what kind of financial institution can help them to you know, provide financial services? Then it should be local banks, community-based bank. So for the developing country, they should develop those kind of financial institution. And, and if they can have this kind of financial institution, two things. First, the labor intensive sector will grow faster. And as a result, you provide more jobs. So all the labor force can be employed. Secondly, because those kind of sectors are consistent with your competitive advantages. If it's consistent with your competitive advantages, they are going to be very competitive. They are going to make a lot of profit. With the profit, certainly you will make investment and turn into capital. So that means the capital will be accumulated very fast. If capital accumulated very fast, then you will know that the return to capital will decline. But at the same time, you know, the labor force will be absorbed and it turn from the relatively abundant to relative scales. Capital from relatively scales to relatively abundant. As a result, the wage rate will increase very fast. And so for the poorer people, I mentioned wage is the major source of their income. So their income will increase very fast. For the rich people, the major source of their income is capital. The return to that will be you know, gradually decline. And so as a percentage of their income in the economy will be smaller. And as mentioned that if the poor people have a larger share, larger you know, proportion in the national income, then your consumption will increase because their propensity for consumption will increase. And in this process, you remove the subsidy to the corporation. Because currently, corporation receive two subsidies. One is excess. The other one is low cost. In the future, with the competition in the financial sectors, then the interest rate will be increased. So they will not be, you know, they will not get those kind of subsidy. So their profit will decline. So that is the way to, you know, reallocation of the national income to the poor people. And with this, the national saving, you observe high reserve will be reduced. Because, you know, the consumption, domestic absorption will become larger. And so the gap between production capacity and domestic absorption will be smaller or gradually disappear. And so what you produce, you will be consumed domestically, then you will not turn into the trade surplus, right? So that's the way to address that. Yes, what will happen to the Chinese economy when the Communist Party falls? Falls? <laughs> well, that is an assumption. I don't think that, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a fact. It's not a, it's not a reality. And, uh, and uh, there's no reason why a political system which is so adaptive to the system, adaptive, flexible, will collapse. Only the system which are not adaptable will collapse, right? And then you can see that if the Chinese Communist Party has the ability to adapt itself in the past 30 years to tap into the opportunity and uh, to maintain the growth, I don't think that will happen. Here in the back. Thank you. Thank you for speaking today. Very informative, sir. What have been the ecological real costs, including so-called externalities, to the use depletion, AKA depreciation of China's natural resources over the past 35 years or so? Oh, I didn't get that. What did he say? No, he asked, uh, yeah. what, what has been the effect of the externalities? I think he's speaking to yeah, okay. Uh, the uh, Okay, you talk about the uh, environment issue and so on, right? Is that what you mean? You know, certainly it's such a rapid economic growth, and you can see air pollution become intensified. For this, i like to mention several things. You need to look into the stage of development. China entering into the industrialization stage. 
And in this industrialization stage, certainly it's energy intensive, it's carbon intensive. And so you observe some pollution and uh, being intensified. But this is not unique to China. We know that London had a nickname called the Foggy City. How come London used to be so foggy? It was because of industrialization, a lot of pollution. And London now is very clean, right? Very good environment. How come its environment is so good? Well, for two reasons. Certainly because uh, they become richer, they have more resources to deal with the pollution issue. More important than that was that in the United Kingdom now, the services contribute to more than 85% of GDP. They have entered into the post-industrialization. And uh, in the service economy, it's less energy intensive, it's less carbon intensive. And I think that this is not a unique story in London. It's the same story in Munich. It's the same story in Tokyo. OK, so I think that if China continues to grow, certainly, China will reach certain income level entering into the post-industrialization. That's one thing. And secondly, the air pollution and so on has externality. Agree? But China need to internalize all the externalities. Because China is a country with a continental size. So all the environmental issue and our climate change issue, the consequence will be internalized in China. And because of that, the Chinese government pay a lot of attention to the improvement of the environment, to you know, switch to the energy saving and clean energy. And at this records, you know, for example, you can see China now has a 12th five-year plan and an 11th five-year plan. There were two targets. One is to reduce the energy intensity of the GDP in China 20% within five years. The second one was to reduce the pollutant intensity 10% in five years. China achieved that. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, if you're talking to people who are involved in the climate change negotiation, in general, they were very impressed by the ability and uh, the eagerness of the Chinese system, Chinese government, to deal with the environmental issue. <clears throat> yeah, I, I just have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So his real question is my question also. His question is, what is the real cost of the environment? Does That's the World Bank cost money in terms of money? What is the real, how we can evaluate external cost, such as the environment? Why I ask this question? Because, because I was told that the growth rate, the income that you just mentioned, yeah. will be significantly changed, or even go to negative, if we consider the cost of the environment, if the loss of the natural resources. Yeah. And also, you also mentioned, you know, yeah. the, uh, there is also a word that I didn't hear today, the sustainability. So you talk about you know, 20 years uh, yeah. growth for next uh, you know, uh, 20 years, but how about like next 200 years, 2,000 years? Okay, thank you. Well, you see that far? Well, <laughs> well, certainly in academics, we always need to look far ahead to consider something 200 years or 2,000 years. I really encourage you to think about those kind of issues. And I, so far, I haven't looked that far. <laughs> But secondly, in terms of externality and so on, well, we have the Department of Resources in Agriculture. I'm sure we have so many famous professors here. They can come up with measurement and, and to, to assess that. And what I'd like to say, without growth, it's not necessary to have an environment. Because if you have a huge population density and pressure, Without growth, they are going to do a lot of harm to the natural resources. They are going to do the deforestation. They are going to intensify the farming and uh, will turn the soil into you know, all kinds of problems. So I think the way to solve the issue is not to stop the growth. The way to solve the issue is that 
Well, on the one hand, continue to do the technological innovation to improve the technological efficiency. And also to internalize those kind of externalities into your press system. But I'd like to say, you also have a fairness issue. You know, high income country has been growing for 250 years with high carbon path. And uh, in terms of the climate changes, what is the stock of the carbon in the air? And uh, I would say, I don't have exact number, so let me guess. 90% of the stock in the air was produced by high income country. And certainly, we need to handle this kind of issue. But who should pay the cost? Should developing country pay all the cost? Or should developing country stop the process in order to avoid the worsening of the stock of carbon in the air? Well, we need to invite some philosopher and a political scientist to answer that question. For me, I think the way out is growth, a better growth, a better technology growth. I remember when I was young, in the 1960s, there was a book, so scary, called The Limit to Growth by the Club of Rome. And it was a book produced all the famous, well, not all, a lot of leading economists, scientists at that time. And they predict. By the time. I don't think there were any leading economists signing off on that. <laughs> they, they predict by the time of 2000, all the oil has been disappeared, all the iron ore, all the resources have been disappeared. We still have so many oil there, we have so many oil, iron there. So I think that, you know, certainly we need to look far ahead. But at the same time, we also need to understand it's a challenge. But I'm an optimistic person. I think every challenge has a solution. And we are here to provide the solution. All the way back here. Thank you for excellent speech. I have two questions. Uh, I have two questions. As many Western Chinese scholars point out, uh, China is facing severe hierarchical corruption. I wonder how this corruption affects Chinese economy growth. Also, as you mentioned, that China paid the cost for the uh, economic inequality between the rich and the poor. So I wonder how Chinese government plan to remove this uh, imbalance. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question about the corruption issue. I think it's a big issue in China. The corruption affect income distribution. The corruption affect social cohesion. So China need to deal with that. And I would say corruption is also very widespread. I can give you some evidence. In the past 10 years, one of the most rapid development in China is a highway system, right? In 98, the highway in China only 4,700 kilometers. And now it increased to about 60,000 kilometers, second only to the US. Highway was a large infrastructure public project, very easy to have corruption. And you can imagine, China has, China has 31 provincial labor government. And each government has one highway bureau, transportation bureau. 19 of the head of the highway bureaus were sentenced for corruption. <laughs> So about two thirds, right? So it's very wide spread. But I also have other indicators. I think a highway is the best indicator about how corrupt the system is. And, and I travel a lot. I, went, I travel to Latin America country. I travel to African country. I also travel in high income country. Because highway has 
international standards. And uh, if it's corrupted, it reduces the quality, right? So the poorer the quality of the highway, the higher the corruption the country is. <laughs> I invite you to visit China. You will find China's highway system might be the best in the whole world. <laughs> in terms of quality. <laughs> In terms of quality. In terms of quality. So yes, there's corruption there. That reminds that But you know, it, it's an issue we need to handle. But competitively speaking, I would say the corruption, degree of corruption in China, it's not forgivable. Even one sense of corruption, we need to get rid of that. But at the same time, if you compare the quality, I'll be so lucky to be a Chinese because the highway system in China quality is so good compared to when I travel in Northern America, compare new highway with a new highway in China, when I travel in high income country, when I travel in Latin, in African country, I would say the highway system in China, the quality is among the best. But, but I have no tolerance for corruption. If I know someone corruption, I will accuse them. All the way back here, the last row. No, fellas, hand up. <laughs> <laughs> I have to find the microphone. Um, I think one big advantage uh, China has, um, it has a downside, of course, but the government at the national level, at least, um, can make major decisions without uh, the kind of um, things we go through here. You don't, have, <laughs> you don't have a Republican Party that is in the way of every sort of progress, okay? Now the danger, of course, is, I mean, if you do things right, it's very efficient. If you do something wrong, um, it could set things back a bit. Um, and I was in China a couple of years ago when they had this big scandal. They were arresting, I don't know, how many, I couldn't understand uh, Chinese, but uh, you could tell just from television there was a trial of all these people um, uh, around one of your major cities. Um, and it used to be called Chongqing. <laughs> it's now what, uh, Chongqing? Yeah, I always have trouble pronouncing it in a new way. Anyway, of course, the penalties for corruption in China yeah. are very strict, often the death penalty, which I think many people here would have problems with. <laughs> On the other hand, the penalties here, there was a case between Citibank and the SEC, uh, SEC the other day, and the judge threw it out because it was such a cozy deal partly because the SEC doesn't have the staff to do the job they're supposed to do, partly maybe because that's the way things are done here. They let corporations off, they let them commit all sorts of things. So um, there's different systems, different ways. Well, the, the question is, um, <laughs> No, I, I really would like you to uh, comment on the fact of how things can get done in China uh, so rapidly compared to here. Um, and is that a major reason why um, China's advancing so fast in their economy? And I, I also wondered, what, uh, of course, it was a while back, the Cultural Revolution, what impact did that have on the development of China's economy? It's a good question, a very challenging question. I think I will invite a few PhD students to write a dissertation on this, to have this kind of competitive political or cultural system. But my answer to you is that I'm a student of Gary Baker's. <laughs> And Gary Baker had one very famous article about crime and punishment. And he, you know, in a modern show, the way to deal with a crime, one 
is to you know, increase the probability of being detected or to increase the severity of punishment. And there are some substitution to that. So if your political system, your culture means that you cannot have a severe punishment, then you need to increase the probability of detection and to deal with that. That's one thing. And then secondly, whether the possibilities of a severe punishment and the use mobilize the mass, the majority of people to supervise and so on, give China some advantages. Well, I think it may be, but it's not a necessary condition. Because as I mentioned, Japan, Korea, Taiwan also achieved similar gross performance. They did not have those kind of political system, but they could do that. Not only the East Asian Confucianist culture. I mentioned Mauritius. Mauritius in the 1950s, 1960s was considered as a hopeless economies. In effect, World Bank invited James Mead to write a report about the futures of Mauritius in the 1950s on behalf of the World Bank. And the conclusion from his report, he said this was a hopeless land. Because first, they have all the issues called the ethnic conflicts. And they have all the issue of distortion. In addition to that, they have some kind of natural disadvantages. It's far away from all the major markets. And it's a tiny economy. In the 1950s, the population in Mauritius was only about 400,000, less than half a million. So all the disadvantage in the textbook we can find Mauritius all had that. But Mauritius now became a star in the world. It was the highest income country in Africa. Its per capita income measured by market exchange rate is close to 9,000. By purchasing power parity, about 15,000. So if Mauritius was, also it's a democratic system, OK. Could turn around. I think every political system, every society should have the opportunities. If we really can find a way to bring in this kind of modern economic growth into their society, then all the country has the opportunity to turn around. I'm not hopeless because you know, I reflect my own life. When I was young, I was so poor. In Taiwan or in mainland. But they all changed. And when we were young, we were always very, you know, like other young people, always like to complain. And I think that the country is hopeless. But they all change, right? So let's be a little bit more optimistic about the world. That's a great note to end on. Thank you very much.